And so this was now seven years ago, and the Lord reminded me of this today, and he said, listen, seven is the number of completion, perfection, wholeness, and covenant. And for the last seven years, in the midst of political upheaval, in the midst of crazy wickedness, in the midst of corruption, in the midst of all kinds of crazy, does it just seem like sometimes you turn on the news and it feels like the, the world has lost its mind? Does it seem that way to you? In the midst of that, God said, I was actually setting up a scenario that wasn't just divine reversals for individuals. Okay, because we've watched people have prodigals turn around and come home, have financial disaster turn around and be averted, have foreclosures of their homes turned around and they're blessed, have, uh, have diseases reversed, had all kinds of amazing, I mean, Pastor Sharon was, uh, Sharon, stand up, Sharon was, uh, had gone blind in one eye, and uh, the doctors said that there really wasn't anything else they could do for her. She was standing right there on a Sunday morning. God touched her, completely healed her eye, completely restored her sight. I'm telling you, divine reversal, amen? We have seen so many miraculous things, but the Lord said, enough is enough of all the craziness, and he said, that this now marks a season where you're going to begin to see divine reversals on a national scale and on a global scale of some things that look right now today to be impossible. How many believe that we serve a God of, of impossibilities? He's a God that takes impossible things and turns them around. On January the 4th of 2021, when the world, the, the country was going crazy and it was two days before the January 6th thing that happened, um, we were in a time of prayer and the Lord said this to me. He said, tell the people, tell the people, this is you, you're the people. He said, tell the people I'm up to something. And listen, I knew when God said it, I wasn't going to like what happened. I knew when he said it, it was kind of like with this tone, like, okay, tell them I'm up to something. But basically, you're going to have to keep your eyes on me and know that the devil's not pulling the strings. I'm pulling the strings. I'm the one that's working behind the scenes because I've got a much bigger picture than some situations that are temporary or that are limited by time. I'm setting up a scenario that's going to cause generational blessings for decades to come. Not just a daily turnaround, not just a monthly or a yearly, but something that is going to set a course that is going to set things up to begin to see things shift for the next several decades. I mean, we are in a, in a critical hour. And so when I heard the Lord say, it's time for the hanging of Haman's 10 sons, you know, I was like, oh my goodness, let's, let's find out what this means. Let's find out the fullness of what this means. Now, if you haven't read the book of Esther recently, I want to encourage you to go home and read it. Don't start reading it while I'm preaching. You'll miss what I say. But Esther, Esther is not just a love story. It's not just like, oh, this little orphan girl married the king and they lived happily ever after. That is not the story of Esther. Esther is the story of the modern ecclesia, the modern church, Jesus said, I will build my church, I will build my ecclesia. The ecclesia wasn't just a gathering spot. The ecclesia was a governing body in Greece. I will build my governing body, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Now, Esther is a symbol of the ecclesia that is learning how to come before God's throne of grace, God's scepter of favor. How many know Hebrew says that we come boldly before God's throne of grace to find mercy and help in our time of need? So it's the picture of us as Esther, the Esther church. And guys, listen, if we have to always be preached about David and Samuel and Samson and you guys can be the Esther church tonight, okay? How many know we're all going to be the bride of Christ, okay? 
but it's the picture of us being that force that comes before the king in the face of a decree of death and destruction, and the king stretches out that scepter of favor and says, ask whatever you want. Ask to change a nation. Ask to see generations shift. Ask to see curses broken. Ask to see things begin to be set a new course for the future. And the Esther church comes and destroys the strategies of Haman. Haman, not Haman. I'm really hoping I didn't misspell it, okay? For those of you that aren't familiar with the story, Esther, of course, became queen. I love the book of Esther. I have to really, like, keep myself in... Going, but let me just say this. You know the beginning of the book when Vashti refuses to come before the king. She was the first queen. See, there's a shift that's taking place in the church today because there's a true church that understands that we are the ecclesia. We are the church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. And there's a church that has a form, but they don't even believe what they say they believe anymore. Are y'all in a hurry tonight? Can I just, because when I say something like that, I want to tell you a story. So I was sitting on a plane next to somebody, next to, next to this guy, and I was reading a book that had a Christian title. He was reading a book that had, looks like a Christian title, and so we saw each other's books and we started talking. And um, he, you know, he mentioned, he said, I'm a pastor. And I said, oh, I'm a pastor too. And he kind of looked at me. That's a whole different conversation. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and, and so we started talking, and I said, so, um, so what, what, church do you, what church do you pastor? And he said, oh, the name of my church is the Christian Church. I was like, that's awesome. I said, um, what is your, what's, your, what's your doctrine? I mean, what, you know, what do you guys believe? And he goes, oh, we are a, a non-doctrinal church. And I did that. I started laughing. I thought he was joking. He goes, no, no, really, really, we don't, we don't preach doctrine. And I was like, okay, um, come here and let me slap you. No, um, uh, no. I was like, okay, so what do you guys preach? And he said, oh, we preach love. And I said, oh, okay. All right, well, I believe in love. Okay, that's good. God is love. Um, I said, but surely you believe that um, with a name like the Christian church, you believe that Jesus is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life, right? No man comes to the Father but by, by him. And the guy rolled his eyes at me, and he said, oh, oh, my God, you sound like a Baptist, which was totally a compliment, okay? It was like, um, okay, but, but Jesus did say those things. And he goes, no, 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 that was poetic speech. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm not familiar with that term. You know, I was, y'all would have been so proud of me. I just wanted to, like, you know, but I didn't. I just was, like, calm and conversing, and I was like, okay, um, I don't understand poetic speech, and he said, um, well, it's, a, it's as if I were to say, my wife, Pat, is the most beautiful woman in the world. You see, I know that she's not actually the most beautiful woman in the world, but because I love her, I would make statements like that. Well, that's what the disciples did, that out of their love for Jesus, they made these extravagant statements like, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I want to clarify, the name of his church was the Christian church. Or how about the Vashti church? You see where I'm going with this? This really isn't in my notes, okay? But there's, there's something that's happening in the church today. Is that there are those that understand that we are called to be the ecclesia. We're not called to just go to church. We're called to be the church. We're not just called to, uh, to, uh, to, to go and warm a pew. We're called to demonstrate signs, wonders, and miracles. These signs shall follow them that believe, not them that preach, okay? It's believers. Not believers shall follow these signs. There is a church that gets it, that understands we want to be everything that Jesus called us to be. And it's not about four walls. That's what I love about this service is because we got people from everywhere. We are.
are the church. And so, but there's an old line, dead, dry, denying the power of the Holy Spirit, denying even that Jesus is the only way to salvation. I could call the names of some older denominations that recently in their council meetings have actually removed from their charter language of their denominations the fact that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But they're still classified as a Christian church or let's say a Vashti church. How many understand the, that, that God is lifting his hand off Vashti and he's putting it on Esther? And he's sending Mordecai. Mordecai is a, is, a, is a symbol of Jesus. He's a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Because Mordecai discerned through spiritual intelligence the plans and the plots and the schemes of the enemy and began to expose them. So the Holy Spirit is coming and challenging the Esther church and saying, guess what, if you guys don't step up, if you don't let your voice be heard, destruction is going to come to you, but God will raise up somebody else. And how many know that we got ourselves into a lot of this mess in this nation because the church was silent? They took prayer out of school, the church was silent. They codified Roe versus Wade, the church was silent. A lot of different things down through the ages, even in our day. And even since we've been leaders, we have been silent for the most part as a church. And God is saying, it is now time for the Esther church to arise and lift up her voice and lift up her head and be willing to take risks. Be willing to go before the king. Be willing to go before the courts of men and do whatever is necessary to begin to bring a divine reversal.